Your camera is a computer and your computer probably has a camera. We're gonna talk today about computational photography, where phones and software use processing to wring impressive images out of tiny smartphone sensors. Welcome to Upscaled, our show where we explain how your favorite tech works. In our last episode, we took on high dynamic range video, and I'm super glad that piece helped a lot of you understand what's going on with HDR video, especially the dreaded gamma curve. And yes, we didn't make that video in HDR, because if I learned anything from researching, it's that correctly mastering HDR is a pain. And the last thing I wanted to do was to screw up how all of those beautiful black and white gradients looked on your screens. One correction that came in from a disconcertingly senior person at NBC, HLG, the high dynamic range standard designed for backwards compatibility with older SDR TVs, will actually only render properly on TVs that support the REC 2020 color space, which few current SDR sets do, and essentially none that are older than three or four years. Other TVs may get some pretty gnarly color shifts. Also, a new broadcast standard called ATSC 3.0 would allow for 4K HDR over the air, but it's been slow to deploy, and you'll probably need either a new TV or an antenna adapter to use it if it ever does become popular. But enough HDR video, today we are here to talk about computational photography. Now, technically all digital photography is computational. The data coming off the sensor is just an array of voltage values, almost like a spreadsheet, and it takes software and processing to turn that into an image. So, Computational photography is a pretty broad term, but these days it's most often used to refer to any photography that uses algorithms or processing to produce an image beyond the capabilities of just the lens and the sensor by themselves. The new iPhone 11 and Pixel 4 in particular have some impressive processing tricks to yield superior photos by boosting dynamic range, capturing clear images in the dark, and enhancing resolution. One note, this is not a review or comparison of these phones. Feel free to sound off in the comments with your pick for best smartphone camera. I'd be curious to hear what you think, but for now, this is just about the tech. Smartphones in particular have challenges when it comes to photography, namely their tiny, tiny sensors. You may have noticed the megapixel wars are pretty much over, and most flagship smartphone sensors now are 8 to 16 megapixels, and there's a reason for this. For one, 12 megapixels is actually enough for most uses, and two, the more pixels you cram onto a sensor, especially a tiny one, the smaller those pixels have to be. A smaller pixel, especially coupled with a tiny lens, captures less light. This means the camera ends up essentially building the scene from less information, and it can lead to a noisier image. Digital noise is the colored static or fuzz that we see in some photos, especially in low light. It's essentially the background electricity in the camera mistakenly getting recorded as image data. Now, the stronger the signal the camera can record, i.e. the incoming light, the less of the noise we see in the final image. But this is especially a problem then in low light, where the camera has to increase the ISO to capture a bright image. ISO is a measure of gain. It amplifies the signal coming from the sensor, but it also ends up amplifying the noise. So if the signal isn't particularly strong, i.e. the picture was too dark, the noise will end up making the image fuzzy. It's like turning up the volume on an old recording. The song gets louder, but so does the hiss and crackle of the tape. For a 12 megapixel smartphone sensor, the pixels are typically on the order of about two microns square, while Sony's a7S II, generally considered to be one of the best low light cameras around, has pixels that are a whopping 70 microns square. So taking a photo of the same scene, the a7S II could in theory capture 35 times more light per pixel giving it a huge advantage in signal-to-noise ratio. In reality, larger pixels also means the Sony can use a much larger lens to deliver way more light to the sensor, versus the tiny lenses on the smartphone cameras. But take all these pieces together, and phone cameras can't capture as much light, making noise a bigger issue and just degrading their performance in the dark. Larger sensors also tend to improve dynamic range, which we talked about in the last episode on HDR video. This is the difference between the brightest and the darkest parts of an image. At low ISO, i.e. with plenty of light, smartphones actually do pretty okay. They can still end up with noise in the shadows, though, if you try to brighten the dark parts of the image. At higher ISO, dynamic range typically goes way down, and the sensor gets worse at handling contrast. This means parts of the scene will either end up totally black or clip and go totally white, either way losing a lot of color and detail. 
So here's where phones have a great trick, HDR photography. In a high contrast scene, like backlit against the sky or a bright lamp in a dark room or my cat in the window, the camera takes multiple images and combines them into one improved photo. This trick of combining images has actually been around since film photography. Photographers would take a series of images at different exposures from super dark all the way to super bright and combine them, originally in the dark room and these days in a program like Photoshop. In recent decades, this has been driven by real estate and architectural photography, because by combining light and dark images, you could show both an interior scene and the bright outdoors through the windows. Traditional HDR like this required the images to be nearly identical, or the composite image would end up smeared or have ghosts. Smartphones started using this same process a while ago, using software to automatically align multiple images taken at different exposures and correcting for any handshake while you're photographing. But this method does have problems. In low light, the long exposure times required can make for blurry images, and the exposure for each different scene does need to be enough to capture all the details from the extreme brightest end to the darkest parts of the image. If you actually want to see how this works, the Open Camera app will let you not only save a final HDR image, but all of the images that were taken and combined in the process. The big change here came with Google's HDR Plus mode, released in 2014. HDR Plus still merges multiple images, but the big change is it doesn't vary exposure time, and it tries to keep the shutter speed quick enough to eliminate motion blur. The camera exposes for the brightest part of a scene, taking a series of images that in other circumstances would be far too dark. But here's where the magic comes in. Normally, boosting the exposure of those dark parts of the image would increase the noise, but because most noise is fairly random, by using a bunch of images and averaging them together, you end up averaging out the noise and vastly reducing it. It should be said again, this is actually not a new trick, but the magic is making it happen seamlessly and automatically. Other companies have adopted the same technique as well, but just because it's become common, that shouldn't downplay how impressive it actually is. To do all this, a phone has to set its exposure for the scene, capture a burst of images, align them together, discard any blurry frames or ones that can't be matched, identify the parts of the scene that are too dark, boost the exposure in those regions, average together the burst of images to reduce noise, and you could do all of this in Photoshop with a normal camera, but your phone does it automatically in about a second. To speed things up, the Pixel and other phones now start capturing images the second you open the camera app. And when you hit the shutter button, the previous 9 to 15 images are saved and merged together into the final photo you see. So in a way, the big advancement here isn't traditional HDR with multiple exposures from dark to bright, but it's using multiple images to improve the dark parts of a scene. And it's not a stretch to see here how we get from HDR Plus to Night Sight. On the Pixel, HDR Plus won't use a shutter speed below 1 15th of a second, no matter what, to keep the image sharp and eliminate that motion blur. Night Sight mode sets the shutter speed using not only the scene brightness, but also how much the scene is moving and how much the phone is shaking. Handheld, it'll actually go as slow as a third of a second, but on a tripod with a perfectly still scene, it'll shoot as slow as one second per photo. These images are combined using similar tricks to boost exposure and average out the noise, and presto, a clean, sharp image in the dark. There's a bit more to the magic here, though. Google has actually built a custom machine learning algorithm to do white balance, trained off hand-corrected smartphone photos, which keeps these night pictures from having weird color shifts. Again, other companies have also adopted these techniques, and the results are usually impressive. This mode is more susceptible to ghosting, though, because any motion in the scene can end up smeared or distorted. But in the right circumstances, it looks like magic. One odd side effect of Night Sight that people noticed right away was that if you used it during the day, especially if the phone was steady, your photos sometimes looked way sharper than normal. In fact, even HDR Plus produced surprisingly detailed photos. I remember comparing the Pixel 2 to the iPhone X and Galaxy S9 Plus, and I was blown away by how detailed the Pixel's HDR shots were. It turns out these modes are getting a little boost to resolution from something called demosaicing. So here's what's going on. Almost all camera sensors use what is called a Bayer filter. This is a screen over the sensor's pixels that only let in one color of light, blue, red, or green, in a grid pattern. Because each pixel can only see one color, after the image is captured, the pixels are analyzed and averaged together to create the final true color of the image. Now, the algorithms that do this are seriously impressive, but still some of the information has to be inferred or, well, 
made up. And because of this, depending on the scene, your camera is actually only capturing around 50 to 75% of the resolution of the sensor. The thing is, if you could shift the sensor by just a pixel and capture multiple images, you could get the full red, green, and blue values for each pixel and create a higher res image. Some cameras, like the Panasonic S1R, can do this automatically by moving their sensor minutely, though only on a tripod. HDR and night sight modes benefited from this to a degree from the effect of stacking multiple images together. But new super res zoom and super resolution modes on some phones take advantage of this effect to increase sharpness and detail even in digitally zoomed images. They use the natural motion of your hands to create the pixel shift, and will even use the phone's optical stabilizer if the phone is totally steadier on a tripod. Again, the challenge is properly merging the frames, and these techniques definitely work best on unmoving scenes. While we've been talking a lot about Google here, Apple has really taken things to the next level with its deep fusion mode, which essentially just combines everything we've been talking about. What it does, it shoots nine images. Before you press the shutter button, it's already shot four short images, four secondary images. When you press the shutter button, it takes one long exposure. Up until this point, most of these techniques have relied on traditional algorithms, but Apple is saying Deep Fusion goes all in on the AI. Machine learning algorithms analyze each part of the scene, using the fast shots to increase detail and sharpness in areas like fabric, foliage, or architecture, and using the longer exposures to reduce noise and improve color in the shadows. And the results here can be impressive, but they're also sometimes kind of hard to see without zooming all the way in on the image. This may actually be a testament to how good the normal HDR shots are on the iPhone 11, but Deep Fusion didn't always seem like a giant improvement to me. So why is this restricted to phones? Surely high-end cameras have some processing power too, right? Well, sort of. Most professional digital cameras do have ARM processors in them that aren't that different from smartphone processors, but they lean much more heavily on their ISPs, or image signal processors. These are relatively inflexible processors that are really good at doing one thing, turning sensor data into image files. Sony's a7 III can shoot 24 megapixel raw photos at 10 frames per second with the help of a powerful ISP, but it's paired with a relatively puny four-core ARM Cortex-A5 processor. It was hard to even find comparisons here because the A5 was actually designed a decade ago, but the chip in the Pixel 4 is conservatively 30 times faster than the one in that Sony camera. Now, this isn't to say that smartphones don't have ISPs as well, they definitely do, but the point is they have a lot more general computing power available to them than the average pro camera. However, some companies are starting to bridge the gap. Fujifilm's just announced X-Pro3 has an HDR mode that will combine three images into one shot in camera to boost dynamic range, and we expect to see more companies following suit in the near future. This is just a bit of what can be considered computational photography. Technically, even things like instant panoramas are a type of computed photo, and we didn't even talk about portrait mode. Most of the techniques that a phone can achieve here are doable in editing software, but the real innovation is having these processes happen instantly and seamlessly within your device. Software and processing will only get better, but so will the cameras themselves. New nanomaterials could vastly improve the tiny lenses of smartphone cameras, and curved sensors could increase light gathering and sharpness. And some prototype sensors made from graphene or organic compounds need far less light to function. On the totally weird side, researchers have even demonstrated lensless cameras that focus light with interference patterns, or so-called compressive imaging, which can capture an image from a single pixel. And as someone who still has to carry around a big heavy camera most days, I can't wait. Let us know what you think in the comments. Do you like these new camera modes, or do they kind of feel like cheating? And what do you actually think about these phones? I have been an Android user since my first smartphone, but I gotta admit, the iPhone 11 Pro is real, real nice. Anyone else feel the same way? Let us know, and be sure to tune in next time.